Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for the privilege you've given us tonight as your children and your servants that we'll be able to listen to your word and apply to our lives and be the kind of people you want us to be. Thank you, Lord, for the peace and the love and the unity and the revival that you are bringing up in our midst. Thank you, Lord, for your intentions and your plans. Thank you for your goal, your desires, for everyone in this church, the leaders as well as the members. Thank you because you've given us a work to do. And this is our chance to get that work done. We are praying, O oh Lord, that your name will be glorified in the church and in every life and in every family in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray that you open our eyes of understanding, that we will see and behold wondrous things out of your word today in Jesus' name. Interpret your word aright to us. By your spirit, apply the word unto us. By your spirit, energize, empower us to be able to do what you are telling us and teaching, instructing us in Jesus' name. Bless your people today, Lord, and thereby make us channels of blessings to people you make us watchmen and overseers and pastors and leaders over. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. We thank the Lord for another privilege, another opportunity to serve the Lord, to listen to the word of God today. Actually, as leaders, we come together. And as we come together, we hear from the Lord. And then we go to our various places and then give the word of the Lord, the mind of the Lord, uh, to the people of God. I really appreciate, I want to say, your attitude and your response uh, to the things I said uh, last uh, Tuesday. I've seen that it's the uh, heart and the mind of everyone that love and peace will reign in our midst. We can put the past behind us and look forward and see what the Lord wants us to do. Life is brief. Life is short. Let's walk in the spirit and then the Lord will bless the work of our hands. Once again, we are coming back now to Joshua. You will remember some two days, two days ago, I distributed uh, the outlines to the five. Joshua chapter 2 verses 4 to 7. At that time, I felt I will not uh, deal with it uh, in teaching because I felt I should just allow you to, uh, to read it. But now I feel that to complete uh, the series, we should go on normally and I will still have to treat uh, that passage. If you have your outline there, you bring it out while we teach. If you don't, just uh, take notes and then when you get back home, you compare with the notes that you have in the outline. Before we uh, move on to chapter 2, let me quickly read to you Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20. Acts, chapter 20, verse 20. is what we call 2020 vision. Acts 20, verse 20. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but I've showed you and I've taught you publicly and from house to house. There Paul, the apostle, was telling the Ephesians he kept nothing bad from them. He had from the Lord, and everything he had from the Lord, he gave unto the people. In verse 27, For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. That should characterize every leader, from the highest to the lowest, whatever we're doing, we should be able to declare unto the people of God all the counsel of God. Why would Paul do that in Jeremiah chapter 48. Jeremiah chapter 48, the, verse, the first part of verse 10. Cursed be he that keepeth, that doeth the work of the Lord deceitfully. Actually, if we're going to serve the Lord, if we're going to preach the gospel, we need to come at it with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, and then do the work of God honestly, sincerely, wholeheartedly and give it everything it takes so that all our heart, everything we have, we're using to really serve the Lord. And we keep nothing back that should be given to the children of God. Now, if that is to be your attitude, my attitude, the attitude of everyone serving the Lord, hear from the Lord and without taking away, without adding, give it to the people, what's to be the edge of the people that hear? In Exodus chapter 19, verse 8. Exodus chapter 19, verse 8. And all the people answered together and said, All 
that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. God wanted the assurance that the people had made up their minds that they were going to be obedient to the word which God was sending to them through their leader Moses. And when Moses uh, challenged them and told them, this is what the Lord wanted all the people without exception, young and old, and the men and women, all said, all that the Lord had said unto us, we will do and we will be obedient. That's exactly what the Lord is expecting of you and expecting of every one of us today. We're now in Joshua chapter 2. Joshua chapter 2, where they actually studied um, somehow chapter 2 verses 1 to 7 before. But you see, for many centuries, the lie that Ray had to, to protect the spies had been a stumbling block to many people. In fact, some so-called Christians have made it a debatable issue whether falsehood is not sometimes permissible. Many nominal Christians, that is ordinary churchgoers, have maintained that lies are even sometimes lawful if the purpose or the goal, the aim of telling such a lie is not to hurt anyone, but to save your face or to keep your job or to do some other good thing which cannot be otherwise done without telling the lie. Without a grace and salvation, it is almost impossible to always tell the truth without faith in God and absolute trust and confidence in Him. To overrule all situations and all circumstances, it is difficult to tell the truth at all times and in all situations. In fact, without fixing your eyes on eternity, the easiest thing to do in some trying circumstances will be to avoid a truth and then to tell lies. But we need to understand this, that Rahab was a heathen that means a pagan that means an untaught ungodly unrighteous person who had lived all her life in superstition and in the in the corrupt ethics of of her land in her own time and even now heathen pagan morality had not arrived at the idea that the truth must in all cases be spoken there, there are those who even will ask others to tell lies on their behalf. This was always uh, known to be a part of a uh, heathen practice. We don't have the time to look at all the references. But if you look at Judges chapter 4, verses 17 to 21, you will see a man there uh, that had said that uh, a lie should be told on his behalf. Uh, to protect uh, him and therefore you know that among the pagan people heathen people ungodly people unrighteous people people who did not know the lord that was a normal thing isn't it like that today in offices in homes in families in communities that even there are people that expect that to be a good neighbor you have to tell a lie to cover them up in one way or the other in different circumstances but we want to look at this scene um, in, in a microscopic way today that's that means we take a magnifying glass and we look at the word of god and the things that are hidden between the lines and the things that people do not ordinarily see we want to be able to see so that will be the leaders that god wants us to be able ministers of the new testament that will be able to teach the righteous ideals and the righteous principles of the word of God without a subtraction, without addition. There are three points we're looking at today. Number one, Rahab's ignorance and sin. Of course, she was ignorant. She didn't know the high standard of the Lord. She had not been taught. Rahab's ignorance and sin. But she wasn't uh, the only one. Somebody had done that even uh, before, uh, before her. And that leads us to point number two. Rebecca's impatience and suffering. Rebecca's impatience and suffering. And then number three, we we'll look at the conclusion of scripture. Where we we'll look at the recompense for all iniquity and sin. The recompense for all iniquity and sin and sin we come to number one which is um, rahab's ignorance and sin let's turn to joshua chapter 2 i'm reading from joshua chapter 2 verse uh, verse 2 uh, reading from verse 1 to get the whole picture and uh, joshua the son of Nun, sent out of shitting two men uh, to spy secretly saying go view the land even uh, jericho and uh, they went and came into an harlot's house uh, uh, named Rahab and lodged there. We have already learned that uh, these two spies were sent out. Moses in his own time spent, uh, sent out 12 spies. 
but that was to search out the whole land at this time now they wanted to search out just the city jericho and two why not not only that when moses sent out 12 uh, spies uh, only two came back Caleb and Joshua that told uh, the truth and gave the good report and challenged the face of the people and following after that uh, Joshua was now sending out only two these two were actually enough they came to Rahab's house and it says Rahab was an harlot why would they go there we know from the whole said whole story that the Lord had directed them there because that was actually where they got all the information they needed not only that it was where people will normally come a, a harlot's house they didn't go there to commit sin they wanted information and if you were going to find information where people were going to be talking carelessly and loosely where would you go of course it was such a place that's the reason they went there and then it says in verse 2 and it was told the king of Jericho saying behold there came men in hither uh, tonight of the children of Israel to search out uh, the country we learned from that before that the king of Jericho was vigilant and how we ought to be vigilant he was watching over Jericho and we are watching over the people of God my brother my sister you are a leader you are a worker in the church the Lord has made you a watchman over the souls of the people hear the word at his mouth and then give it to the people give warning to the people so that nothing that will endanger their eternal destiny will be allowed to go unnoticed in verse 3 and the king of jericho sent unto rahab saying bring forth the men that are come to thee which are entered into thine house for they be come to search out uh, all the country we learned something here that uh, even though the king of jericho was very very watchful yet eventually the place was captured because except the lord himself watches over the city they that labor and are trying to watch over and uh, they labor in vain we need the protection of the lord of course we should be reasonable and if uh, we can uh, bring and uh, have some protection physically naturally that's all right but always remember some 127 and in verse 1 except the lord build the house they labor in vain that build it except the lord keep the city the watchman wicked but in vain then in verse 4 here comes the real study of today and the woman uh, took the two men and hid them and said thus there came men unto me but i wis not that means i know not whence they were and it came to pass about the time of the shutting of the gate uh, when it was dark that the men went out whither they went i what not that means i know not pursue after them quickly for ye shall overtake them but she had brought them up to the roof of the house and hid them uh, with the stalks of flax which she had laid in order upon the roof and the men pursued after them the way to jordan unto the forts and as soon as the they which pursued after them were gone out they shut the gate that is the lie that uh, she told and uh, as we're looking at uh, this we need to understand that by all standards Rahab was ignorant of the law of God. She had no book of the law, like Joshua had, like the children of Israel had, neither had the word of the Lord been revealed unto her. No evangelist had taught her, no teacher of the word of God had taught her God's righteous principle, righteous standard, righteous truth. She did not know, she could not have known, that all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, according to Revelation chapter 21 verse 8. So, she told a lie to protect the spies from being discovered. A sin of lying is not an excuse for a Christian today who has been taught and who, is, who has been nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine. We need to emphasize, we need to understand that we have no excuse at all today. In fact, a good motive can never render a sinful action desirable or justified. I say that again, a good motive, a good desire, a good end, a good goal, a good outcome, a good result can never render a sinful action and righteous action desirable or justified in the sight of God. Uh, the word of God teaches us very clearly in Romans chapter 3. 
Romans chapter 3, reading there from verses 7 and 8, it tells us very clearly that as uh, children of God, we must not follow after the Edenic principle, pagan principle, uh, the unrighteous principle to do good, that uh, to do evil, that uh, good may be the result. It says in Romans chapter 3, verse 7, For if the truth of God has more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? Paul the Apostle was uh, uh, stating here an hypothetical case. It says uh, there are people that will say, but you know, uh, the, uh, the, the unbelief of the Jews has actually brought uh, a salvation to the Gentiles. Shall we continue the unbelief because of that? And the hardening of the heart of Pharaoh has uh, brought actually God's miraculous power out to be manifested in Egypt. That's okay. That's all right. Does that mean then we continue in our righteousness so that our righteousness will bring a glory to God? It says, but I'm still being judged a sinner. If we are going to walk by that principle, why then am I? also judged as a sinner and not rather as we be slanderously reported and as some affirm that we say let us do evil let us abandon ourselves to evil after all god has a way of bringing good out of it if we are going to go by the principles of the righteous people then let us uh, do evil that good may come what's the conclusion whose damnation is just that is those who reason like that those who act like that their damnation is just actually uh, the, the the point is that uh, Rahab was ignorant and uh, but uh, listen to this was her life justified and approved by God no doesn't the success of her protective lie show that her lie was not counted as sin no not at all though water flowed from the rock which Moses smote in his anger twice yet that was no proof that God approved of his wrong action in smiting that rock twice. God sovereignly overruled Rahab's conduct, yet that did not vindicate her, justify her, or render what she did as uh, being a righteous act in the sight of God. If Rahab had told the truth, would not the spies have lost their lives? No, not at all. When God is on the throne, because you need to understand what uh, Rahab did not understand, what the people at that time did not understand, because all these uh, cases I'm going to make allusion to now, many of them happened after the time of Rahab. But we know that God is ever the same. God is mighty and God is powerful. And we know that uh, God's power would always protect. So, do you remember that God who dried up the hand of Jeroboam when he ordered the arrest of the man of God from Bethel? That's in First Kings chapter 13 verse 4. That same God could have protected uh, those two spies. Do you remember the God that sent only one angel to destroy? 185,000 Assyrians in one night just to protect his own people and to give them the victory in that uh, serious battle. That same God could have done that do you remember that god who sent only two angels and the two angels blindfolded the sodomites and protected lord when he later went out to warn his in-laws in genesis chapter 19 don't you know that that god has power that god has wisdom and that god knows the way with that what to do to be able to protect those two spies even if a lie had not been told the same God who protected Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the furnace of fire. That same God who preserved Daniel in the lion's den. That same God that delivered Peter from the prison miraculously in Acts chapter 12, verses 5 to 11. And that same God that sent an angel to smite Herod uh, with a sudden death. He could have delivered those two spies. God does not need us to commit sin in order to fulfill his holy purpose. My brothers and sisters, did you hear that? That God does not not need us to use the tools of Satan that will be able to effect the holy purpose of God. He does not need us to commit sin in order to fulfill his holy purpose. Sin does not cease to be sin just because something good came out of it. God will not judge us by the outcome or the result of our action, but on the basis of those actions themselves, lying is sin. And whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. Uh, we, we have made allusion to the fact, and you will agree with me, the, the whole Bible uh, says this, that uh, ignorance is no excuse. And uh, that uh, woman was ignorant of the righteous standard of God. Uh, what's the uh, exhortation today to the children of God? Is the exhortation to follow Rehab 
No, the exhortation is to follow Christ. The exhortation is to, is to, is to do what uh, we need to do that we know is righteous. What if they ask me a difficult question and if I answer that question in the affirmative and I said yes, it will get me into trouble. We learn from Christ. We can keep quiet. We don't have to give an answer. We can be quiet and be praying and we can look up to God and we know that all things will work for uh, to uh, will work uh, good in the lives of those who are called uh, by God in Ephesians chapter 4 Ephesians chapter 4 verse 17 Ephesians 4 verse 17 this I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk Rahab is not a perfect example Christ is a perfect example and we are to follow Christ in all things he that says he abides in him ought himself so to walk even as Christ walked if Christ were in that situation where Christ had told a lie uh, no a thousand times and what are we to do then as children of god we are to follow uh, the, the footsteps of christ because these gentiles they walk in the vanity of their minds having their understanding darkened uh, being annihilated from the life of god uh, through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart uh, what are we to do then we're to repent of those times of ignorance because in acts of the apostles chapter 17 Acts chapter 17, reading there in verse 13. Acts 17, verse 13. It tells us very clearly, pointedly, the times of this ignorance God went at. But now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. At the times of the ignorance of Rahab and ignorance of the heathen pagan people, God winked at. But he's even commanding all the heathen, all the pagan, all the people today, nominal Christians and everyone involved in this kind of thing, to repent, to turn away from them. And we who are now in Christ, we are born again, we are children of God, we are cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. What is to be our action? What is to be our attitude? And what is to be our life and conduct? and character in a first peter chapter 1 first peter chapter 1 verse 14 as obedient children not fashioning yourselves according to the former laws in your ignorance or ignorance in the past and therefore maybe we told lies maybe we acted out lies but now as obedient children as the people of god we're not to continue in the telling of lies or the acting of lies and the propagation of lies and co covering up things uh, was lying either lying in words or lying in action we're now to uh, continue to serve the lord with all our heart with all our soul with all our mind and to abide by the principles by the word of god i go now to point number two point number two rebecca's impatience and suffering rebecca's impatience and suffering on the side of um, on the side of uh, rehab there was ignorance on the side of rebecca there was impatience but uh, the impatience also brought out the same thing and we're learning this because it may it may result to the same thing in the life of a child of god today uh, because uh, you understand Understand. Rahab's actions were based on what she knew of God's plan and the prophecy concerning Israel uh, and the land of Canaan. What was that? She, she herself later said in verse 9 of Joshua chapter 2, I know that the Lord has given you the land. Rahab must have thought that because she knew the goal, she knew the aim, she knew that God had given the land already to the children of Israel, anything she did to assist God to achieve his goal or his purpose would be permissible. No, because God is righteous and holy. His ways are perfect. His power is irresistible. He fulfills his own predictions and prophecies through holy righteous means if it cannot be achieved if it cannot be gotten uh, with holy and righteous means let's leave it alone it's not worth uh, the trouble he almighty god can fulfill all his plans concerning anyone concerning anything without our sinful methods but you know rebecca uh, got into this kind of deal rebecca was a uh, isaac's wife the mother of esau and jacob she thought and acted in the same way as a uh, rehab acted later before the birth of Esau and jacob god had revealed to her that the elder shall serve the younger that means that jacob the younger will inherit the blessing of abraham and will rule over the descendants of Esau. when it appeared that the blessing will go to Esau, contrary to the prophecy and plan of god she felt she had to help god listen to that she felt she had to help god to fulfill prophecy she did, but
but she suffered severe, severely for it. Jacob also suffered for a long time. Listen to the testimony of Jacob uh, at, at the end, almost at the end of the whole theme, uh, Jacob said to Pharaoh in Genesis chapter 47 verse 9, the days of the years of my pilgrimage and 130 years few and evil have the days of the years of my life been and there was perpetual hatred and enmity uh, between the descendants of Esau and uh, the Israelites uh, look at the word of God in, the, in Genesis chapter 27 uh, please open your Bible with me Genesis chapter 27 uh, we're reading there the account of uh, Rebekah in her impatience thinking if i don't act immediately a decision is being taken this is the time to do this and so that i uh, will be able to get the deal over and god will not be disappointed maybe god is sleeping maybe god is forgetting maybe god is not going to fulfill it after all therefore let me hurry up and do this in my impatience so that i will help god to actually fulfill his own will i'm reading from genesis to start with chapter 25 in chapter 25 reading from verse 21 Genesis 25 verse 21 and Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren and the Lord was entreated of him and Rebekah his wife conceived and the children many two of them struggled together within her and she said if it be so why am I thus if this pregnancy is answer to prayer why all this trouble and why all this conflict and uh, she said if it be so why am I thus and she went and inquired of the Lord and the Lord said unto her two nations are in thy womb and two, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels and the one shall be stronger than the other people and listen to this and the elder meaning Esau shall serve the younger that was uh, the prophecy the prediction she was armed with that was a knowledge she had even before the birth of the children and she was always looking at uh, Jacob knowing that it will be the God of Abraham the God of Isaac and then that will pass over to Jacob the God of Jacob but uh, look at it now from Genesis chapter 27 and see as uh, Rebecca now was seeing the turn of things as if uh, the Rebecca as if uh, Isaac was going to give the blessing to Esau and Rebecca knew from prophecy from the divine prediction it should not uh, be so in Genesis chapter 27 we're looking at it from verse 6 and Rebecca spake unto Jacob her son saying behold I had thy father speak unto him so thy brother saying bring me venison uh, and make me savory meat that I may eat and bless thee before the Lord uh, before my death uh, now therefore my son obey my voice according to that which I command thee uh, go now to the flock and fetch me from thence two good kids of the goats and I will make them savory meat for thy father such as he loveth and thou shalt bring it to thy father and that he may eat and that he may bless thee before is death and she wanted the blessing to come to you so after all this is the will of god after all this is the plan of god after all this is the purpose there's a prophecy i got before you are even born and then it says uh, it says in verse 11 and jacob said to rebecca his mother behold he saw my brother is a hairy man and i am a smooth man my father peradventure will feel me and i shall seem to him as a deceiver as a liar she, they knew that it was a plan of lying they knew it was was a plan of deception but the, the goal was that the blessing will come to him and I shall bring a curse upon me and not a blessing and his mother in verse 13 said unto him upon me be thy cause my son only obey my voice and go fetch me them and that was a conspiracy uh, to, to go to, to even can you think can you imagine to deceive uh, the husband and to deceive the father uh, of uh, Jacob and then it says uh, and he went and he fetched and brought them unto his mother and his mother made savory meat such as the father loved and Rebecca too goodly raiment and of her eldest son Esau which were with her in the house and put them upon Jacob her younger son and she put uh, the skins of the kids of the goats upon upon his sons and upon the smooth of his neck and she gave the savory meat and the and the bread uh, which uh, she had prepared into the hand of her son Jacob and uh, he came unto his father and said my father 
And he said, Here am I. Who art thou, my son? Here is the lie now. It had been acted out already, well planned. And Jacob said unto his father, I am Esau, thy firstborn. I have done according as thou biddest me. Arise, I pray thee, and see it, and eat my venison, that thy soul may bless me. That's what they were looking for. That this, thy soul may bless me. We're acting out all this. We're doing all this. We were telling this lie. We're making this a deception. We were propagating this program of deception and lie so that thy soul may bless me. And Isaac said unto his son, How is it that thou hast found it, found it so quickly, my son? And now they must drag the name of the Lord into the whole deceptive, uh, deceptive plan. And he said, Because the Lord thy God brought it to me. What profanity, what a shame, what blasphemy. That they even dragged the name of the Lord into it. And Isaac said unto Jacob, Come near, I pray thee that I may feel thee, my son, whether thou be my son Esau or not. And Jacob went near unto Isaac his father, and he felt him and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, and the hands are the hands of Esau. And he discerned him not, because his sons were airy, and his, uh, as his brother Esau's hands, so he blessed him. And then he was still doubting in verse 24, and he said, Art thou my very son Esau? And he said, now he concluded the lie. He nailed the last, the last, the last nail on the lie and said, and he said, I am. And then eventually it says, and he said, bring it near to me, uh, that I, and I will eat of my son's venison, that my soul may bless thee. And he brought it near to him, and he did eat, and he brought him wine, and he drank, and his father Isaac said unto him, come near now, and kiss me, my son. And he came near, and kissed him, and he smelled the smell of his raiment. Uh, that could have uh, given them out, that could have betrayed them, and blessed him, and said, See, the smell of my son is as the smell of a field which the Lord has blessed. Therefore the Lord give thee of the dew of heaven, and uh, the, the fatness of the, of, the, of the earth, and plenty of coin, of corn and wine. Well, you know the story already. Even though we're reading it once again, you will see the deception here, and you'll see that the deception was to give the blessing on to Jacob rather than Esau. But let me ask you, suppose there were no deception. Suppose they had left the things as they were. Could the Lord in any way at all have preserved the blessing uh, for Jacob? Yes, indeed. You remember Balaam? He opened his mouth to curse uh, the children of Israel, even though he intended to curse the children of Israel, and did everything he ought to do to curse them. When he opened his mouth, it was blessing that came out. You will remember that even Saul was telling David that I know that you are going to reign. And he even blessed, he even blessed David. God could have changed those words, the words of uh, the words of Isaac, and the blessing could still have come upon Jacob eventually if there had not been any deception at all. The point is, if we have faith in God, he is able to do what he had intended, intended he was going to do. He is able to bless us, uh, he is able to put us in the position in the place that he wants us to be because all those things have been planned by him and he knows how to fulfill everything look at Deuteronomy and you will find that uh, the, the, the word of the Lord is, uh, is, always, uh, is always to be fulfilled. And no matter what people do, no matter if you think the blessing is going to go to another person, let me rise up now and quickly do something so that uh, the, the blessing will not escape uh, from me. No, you don't need to do anything. The blessing will still come unto you because uh, the Lord himself is able to fulfill all his word concerning uh, the people uh, of God. Let's say uh, the, 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 the passage in Deuteronomy, I might uh, get that later. Let's quickly uh, understand that uh, we don't need to try to help uh, God. Are you trying to help God to fulfill prophecy? It is not necessary. It does not pay at all. Are you trying to do evil that good may come? Can it be right to help, for example, Christian students, if you're a teacher, and change the marks so that uh, you'll fulfill the plan of God and the promise of God that the uh, Christian students will be head and not be tail? No, that will not be right. Is it acceptable to practice injustice, to favor a brother, so as to fulfill his dream? Uh, you know, that brother has a dream. We know the dream is from God. We know it is very certain. 
and it appears that somebody is standing in the way and will not allow the dream to be fulfilled, do we have to do anything that is simple, anything of iniquity, anything of deception, anything that is not according to the righteous, holy standard of God, so that that dream will be fulfilled, not necessary? Can you compromise? Do you have to compromise and sin so as to promote a beloved member of your church? Somebody is in, in your place of work and is a beloved member. And uh, you know that uh, you know they are processing the promotion, but you know you are hiding something. And you know that there is deception, so you can get him promoted. That will not be right. Will God approve of your giving bribes, for example, on behalf of a Christian who desperately needs a job? You say, I know he will not like to give a bribe, but I, I really pity him. He should have got this job because time is going and his family needs this. It is not necessary. Let us remain on the righteous standard of God. Will you cover up the sin of an effective, useful minister so that the prophecy of church growth and mighty revival through him will not be hindered? You know, I know what that fellow has done, but if I let it out, if I talk about it, I also know that there is a prophecy upon his life, a great dream upon his life, that there should be church growth or because of him. There should be church growth because of his ministration and, and a mighty skill and power. And if I let out this sin, uh, the prophecy, the dream may not be fulfilled. Uh, you think that uh, you are the one uh, to bring revival by hiding sin, by, by telling a lie, by uh, being in conspiracy of deception? No, a thousand times no. You do not need to do do evil, perpetrate evil in any way, uh, so that a good may come. Uh, what's the result of all this? That leads us uh, very quickly to point number three. Point number three, recompense for all iniquity and sin. Please notice the subtitle, all iniquity. There is a recompense. There is a day of reckoning. And there is judgment that comes. And the Bible tells us what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his own soul. There is a recompense for all iniquity and sin. In Jeremiah chapter 16, let's open our Bibles. Jeremiah chapter 16, verses 17 and 18. Jeremiah chapter 16, verses 16, verses 17 and 18. I pray that what the Lord is teaching us today, He will grant us the grace and the courage and the fortitude uh, to be able to obey so that we preserve righteousness in our own lives, in our own families, as well as in the church of the living God. Jeremiah chapter 16, verse 17. For mine eyes are upon all their ways, they are not hid from my face, neither is their, iniqui is their iniquity hid from mine eyes. And first, I will recompense their iniquity. That is it. I will punish their iniquity and their sin. Double. Because they have defiled my land. They have filled my inheritance with the carcasses of their detestable and abominable things. You know, the Lord says it will punish all iniquity. He does not uh, want iniquity in our midst. He does not want sin in our midst. Uh, let's live simple lives, sincere lives, holy lives, and righteous lives. And let us leave the results to God after all. What does the Bible say? We came into this world having nothing. We brought nothing into this world. And it is certain we are not going to take anything away. Why then? Are we going to deceive? Why then are we going to do wrong? Why then are we going to commit sin? So I may have this. So you may have this. So he may have this. He does not pay because God says, he will recompense all iniquity in Jeremiah chapter 25. Jeremiah chapter 25, reading from verse, let me read verse 14 first. Jeremiah 25, verse 14. Uh, For many nations and great kings shall serve themselves of them also, and I will recompense them according to their deeds and according to the works of their own hands. Uh, there is no time to read all the references that you have on the outline, but the point is this, that uh, the, the Babylonians uh, were used of God uh, to punish the children of Israel. But uh, they, did, they did what they did by their own wickedness, by their own iniquity. And after the 70 years were over, when the Babylonians had punished, had uh, really uh, had, uh, terrorized and uh, had oppressed uh, the children of Israel, their own wickedness was visited upon them eventually. Great and unsearchable are the ways of God. The revelations of scriptures are high and deep beyond the thoughts of men. The people of Judah were delivered into the hands of the Babylonians because of their sins. Babylon 
was used to punish Judah and to accomplish God's purpose. Yet, listen to this, yet that did not justify Babylon in all that they did against Judah. In their wickedness, Babylon was still punished for her iniquity. Well, to summarize, the Lord is teaching us today that uh, somebody may do evil and it appears that the evil he has done is uh, bringing some good results but my brothers and sisters that will not justify evil that will not excuse evil that will not make god say well, see what the good thing that the evil has done because of the good result because of the good outcome i think i i, I will just uh, leave them and pardon them no in fact what's the greatest story in the bible it is the story of redemption is the death of jesus christ and the death of jesus christ brought salvation to millions of people throughout the world and from the first century until now you see that the effect of the death of jesus is still there do you understand that uh, his death was predicted and prophesied in scripture and it happened that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled that's what we are told in scripture and that he through his death might bring many sons to glory but now wait think meditate does that glorious result of Christ's death justify and excuse those who put him to death? Does the good end justify Judas Iscariot? Does the salvation of millions today justify Caiaphas? Justify Pilate? And justify the Jews? No. A thousand times no. Judas suffered because of what he did. Although what he did has brought salvation to us, has brought the death of Jesus, which also is a means of our salvation. And you know the Jews, they said, let his blood come upon us. And when they said that, they were fulfilling scripture. And in fact, when the blood of Jesus Christ was shed, how are we cleansed now? We are cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. Just because those Jews, they did what they did. You have the peace of God now. You have the joy of God now. You have the salvation of God now. You have eternal life now. And you are going to get to heaven eventually. Because those Jews, they put Christ to death. But does the peace we have, even the growth of the church and the great things the death of Jesus Christ has accomplished, does that justify those Jewish people? No. I say again, a thousand, a thousand times no. A million times no. Evil and sin will never be justified or excused by God. Whatever good result may eventually be produced. God is always going to judge sin. And that severely. Let all the people that know God fear the Lord. The Lord has taught us something good today and the Lord has revealed his might to us. We are called to be holy. We are called to be righteous. We are called to be children of God. And we should not do evil that good may be the result. We were in the story of Rahab. Rahab told the lies and you know she, she got the good result eventually. But what we have learned today, the result of the, the principle we have learned today is that the end does not justify the means. That a good thing will come eventually does not justify that we do evil today as I end up, as I close. Let me read to you Revelation chapter Revelation chapter 2. In Revelation chapter 2, I'm reading there in uh, at the in verse 7, the first part of verse 7. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. The Lord has told us something today, and he says, If you have if we have ears to hear, let us hear in verse in verse 11. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. It's the word of the Lord. The Lord is telling us, He's told us this so that we'll be able to take it to heart in that same chapter, verse 7. Continue that has an ear. Let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Let's rise up now. The Lord has spoken to us. He has spoken to your heart, my brother. He has spoken to your heart, my sister. And in very many things, uh, you may want to get your way through uh, by acting out a lie. You young people, you know that that sister is the one that is meant for you. And you're afraid that if, uh, you know, I don't uh, quickly do this and do that, uh, something may happen. And then you have to tell a lie. And you have to uh, even employ some people to tell lies on your behalf so that that revelation and dream and will of God will be fulfilled. It may be fulfilled. You may marry her. But what comes after the marriage? Uh, let's uh, talk to the Lord and let's tell the Lord, O oh Lord, we know that righteousness is of you. We know that purity is of you. We know that holiness is of you. Whatever happens, whatever we have, whatever we don't have, let there be holiness. Let there be honesty. 
Let there be sincerity. Let there be clean hands and a pure heart. Let there be an open heart and open mind. Uh, a kind of a, a life that is very open and frank and free from all sin. Pray open your mouth my brothers and sisters and talk to the Lord. That Lord help me. That I will not seek after any blessing. Seek after any fulfillment of prophecy. Seek after any kind of a good uh, to be done. By going through the pathway of sin, iniquity, lying, deception. And insincerity and dishonesty. Help me, O Lord, at all times. In all places, with all people. That I will be sincere. I will be honest. I will be holy. I will be righteous, I will be open, I will be frank, I will be Christ-like, and I will do the things that the Lord wants me to do, and then I will leave all results in the hands of the Lord. If we have told lies in the past, we have deceived in the past, we can come to God and say, God, I am sorry. I give myself entirely unto you. From now on, the truth will be the principle of my life. I'll tell the truth in my heart, and I will operate in all ways in the church, at home, in my place of work, everywhere I find myself, I will operate on the principle of always telling the truth. And when I cannot tell the truth, when I, when I, I cannot say anything because of uh, the danger I may bring upon my